else is on. Great. So it gives me huge pleasure to welcome uh, our project leader. Uh, <laughs> he said he wasn't going to give any cheesy introduction. <laughs> <laughs> the cheese hasn't even started yet. Yeah. <laughs> this is just this is just the the initial grilling. So I, I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Josephina Doro uh, from Kiel, as you all know. Um, Remember, you are being recorded. I'm being <laughs> recorded. So I will keep this short and sweet. Um, very much looking forward to hearing your paper on no entry by Intel and Collingwood and the autonomy of the human science. Okay. Thank you, speak. Right. Thank you. And above all, thank you for coming um, uh, from all corners of the world. You are, I, you know, you, you'd always notice that you have to dig very hard to find idealists. Uh, um, let's hope that they don't want drop a bomb on the Chancellor's building, otherwise, <laughs> you know, <laughs> transcendentalism of a kind would become extinct. Um, okay, so I've uh, slightly changed the title. It was Conceptual Idealism and the Autonomy of the Human Sciences, No Entry by Attainment. I focused a little bit on Collingwood because it was becoming too unwieldy, but I read Collingwood as a uh, conceptual uh, idealist. Uh, I also make no apology for the way in which I read Collingwood. So uh, some of you might um, be aware of a, a reading of him as a kind of historicist. I do not read him as an historicist. I read him as a kind of explanatory pluralist. I'm not trying to justify this reading now. I'm just going to take it and run with it. So what is it I'm trying to do? Well, first of all, I'm trying to, with Collingwood, uh, taking some interpretive freedoms, <coughs> to rethink the rescue operations of the mental by exploring a kind of non-reductivism uh, which comes out of a form of conceptual idealism. So the, the thought here is that let's think about non-reductivism in, in a different way. And then to show how this uh, uh, different way in which the mental is defended uh, or rescued from, from reduction is connected with a very different conception of the role and character of philosophical analysis. So what I'm saying is that uh, if you want to change the face of non-reductivism, you've got to change your, your metaphilosophy. And then I also want to locate, uh, very briefly probably, uh, uh, in a kind of hand-waving way, probably, but to locate it in the context of other forms of non-reductivism in, in contemporary philosophy of mind, just to give a sense of what, where the differences lie. So what is the standard rescue operation? Uh, well, the view is that we can rescue the manifest image from elimination. Not everybody thinks that it should be rescued. Some people think that it should be eliminated. But those who think that it should be rescued, by and large, you know, they tend to adopt this strategy. They say that, well, we can rescue it by showing that the manifest image is in some way entailed by the scientific image. Now, the notion <coughs> of entailment that is being appealed to here is not a notion of strict entailment. So uh, it's not the kind of uh, notion of entailment that Descartes was using when he was saying that uh, the concept of the mind does not entail the concept of the body. So when Descartes was saying that, was saying that, uh, look, you can't reduce the concept of the mind to the concept of the body because the concept of the body is not hidden in that of mind. Yeah? It's not that we do not have a proper conception of the mind, and if we had a full conception of the mind, we'd realize that it has to be embodied in the way in which somebody who denies that a cow is a mammal uh, would, could be made to realize that they are wrong yeah, because... Uh, and that they deny it simply because they don't have the full concept of a cow. If, if they had the full concept of a cow, they would see that it is a mammal. Now, the notion of, of entailment that is being appealed here is a weaker notion, is one which uh, 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 appeals to the, the notion of the relation of, of supervenience. And I'm thinking of the kind of claim that uh, is made, for example, by uh, Frank Jackson, Jackson in uh, From Metaphysics to Ethics. And in the book, the, the mental uh, is given entry by, by entailment from the scientific picture. 
Now, the presuppositions of this standards uh, rescue operation is that you begin with a conception of reality as it is presented to you by the scientific image. You then assume that this conception of reality is ontologically basic. And then you ask, how is it that the manifest image, which gives us a different conception of reality, can be accommodated in nature, given that the scientific image is not just an image, but it is a true reflection of what there is. Um, <clears throat> and then the question uh, is, is answered by showing how um, certain manifest qualities are entailed in the weaker sense of entailed by uh, scientific properties. Now, if you go with, with this uh, rescue operation, uh, uh, that uh, brings with it a particular conception of what philosophy does. Um, uh, according to this conception, what there is is discovered by science. Um, and the role of conceptual analysis in metaphysics is very modest because metaphysics doesn't make ontological claims. Yeah, it's science that tells us what there is. Uh, so as Frank Jackson says, conceptual analysis, the role of conceptual analysis, uh, uh, sorry, conceptual analysis is not given a role in determining the fundamental nature of our world. It is rather being given a central role in determining what to say in less fundamental terms, given an account of the world in more fundamental terms. And I think this is a picture of the role of conceptual analysis that is very Lockean, according to which uh, the philosopher is pretty much the, the underlaborer of, of science. Now, what is Collingwood's rescue uh, strategy for, uh, for the mentor, and how does it differ? Well, the way he, uh, he proceeds is pretty much like this. He thinks that the role of philosophy is to track the presuppositions which govern forms of inquiry. Um, that it is part of the job of the philosopher to remind the scientific image of the presuppositions on which it rests. And that is something that the scientific image tends to forget. It is to deny also that there is any form of inquiry that is presuppositionless. That's another way to say that there is no unmediated knowledge. But that's the way in which she puts it. There is no presuppositionless <coughs> knowledge. And that's a feature of both knowledge in, uh, in, the, in the human sciences and in the natural sciences. Now, on this view, the role of conceptual uh, analysis in, in metaphysics um, is not any modest one in the sense of Frank Jackson, because metaphysics is not. Uh, as Collingwood conceives it, or philosophy as Collingwood conceives it, uh, doesn't tell you anything about the structures of reality. Yeah? Uh, philosophy does not seek to discover what uh, there, there is in an inquiry independent sense. Uh, but it is not the underlabor of science either, uh, uh, because it does not take the scientific image to be uh, ontologically basic and to be the form of inquiry which, I suppose, takes the place of a traditional conception of metaphysics in telling us what, what, what there is and what the fundamental structures of reality are. So how does the role of conceptual analysis changes in Collingwood? Uh, he claims that instead of starting with an ontology which is be bequeathed from natural science and give philosophy the role of its underlaborer, what he does is to give philosophy the second order role of inquiring into the uh, presuppositions or methodological assumptions which governs form of inquiry or the special sciences, and to make philosophy into an epistemologically first science, not a traditional form of metaphysics, but an epistemologically uh, first science. Now, what I want to do is to try and show how Collingwood operates, you know, how he arrives at these claims. I'm not going to follow his books by the letter. I'm, I'm going to make up some of my examples. Yeah? Uh, but I think it is in the spirit of, of what he says. Now, according to Collingwood, the role of philosophy is to uncover or to detect presuppositions. That's what philosophy does. Uh, and he believes that every question that uh, we ask rests on some presupposition or other. And this is true of every question, no matter how banal it might be. 
Uh, so uh, suppose that somebody asks, where is the salt? Yeah, a question to which somebody has replied, the salt is on the table. Uh, that question has a presupposition, namely that there is such thing as uh, salt. Okay. So this is a banal example, but we'll see it has quite radical implications once you uh, 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 analyze it further. So what's the job of the philosopher? Well, it's to go back from the answer to the questions to the presuppositions. Yeah? So we provide answers to questions. Yeah? Uh, uh, we move from the answers to the questions to the presuppositions that make those questions possible. So the philosopher is a little bit like a logical detector, a detective yeah, that looks at, at clues, except that it, uh, the regress is here is not temporal or spatial. It's, it's, it's a kind of logical regress. Now, the big claim that he wants to make is that there are no such thing as presuppositionless questions. And this claim is quite far-reaching, because in order to, to gain knowledge, we have to ask some questions. Uh, so if you didn't have any questions, then you wouldn't really know what to look for. So in order to acquire knowledge, you have to have some questions. Uh, but in order to have the questions, you have to make uh, the presuppositions. So he claims that knowledge requires answering questions, or questions rest on some presupposition or other. There is no presupposition. Uh, where there is no presupposition, there is no question. So where there are no presuppositions, there is no knowledge. Now what Collingwood is saying here, or rather what Collingwood is not saying, is that there is presuppositionless knowledge, but we do not have it. He's not saying that. What he is saying is that the notion of presuppositionless knowledge is nonsensical. There is no such thing. Now, what is the task of philosophy? Uh, this is how he describes it in, in an essay on metaphysics. The task of philosophy is not to answer questions. So uh, that, for him, is the task of the special sciences. So if you want to know whether silver dissolves in nitric acid, whether uh, Caesar won the battle of Pharsalus, you, know, you ask the chemist, you ask the historian. You do not ask uh, the philosopher. So <laughs> knowledge is, is acquired in the special <coughs> sciences. Uh, um, the task of philosophy is to detect the presuppositions which give rise to the questions which are answered within the special sciences. So although it doesn't give us knowledge, it's got a very, very important role because it tells us what uh, the presuppositions that make uh, the questions and therefore the kind of answers that are given by the chemists, by the historian, and so on and so on possible. So what philosophy does not give us is knowledge. What it does give us is an understanding of how knowledge claims are possible. So there are, you know, there's a very strong Kantian flavor to this, although there is a difference because Collingwood is not saying, there's no skeptical remainder here, yeah? He's not saying, oh, there is a knowledge that you could have from a presuppositionless point of view, yeah? There is no such thing because the very idea of presuppositionless knowledge is not one that makes sense. Now, for Collingwood, detecting presuppositions requires exposing certain logical relations that are at play between, in, in the game of the answering and, 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 and asking of questions. So there is a logical, I'm using this term logical here in a very loose sense. It's just that I'm not sure, that I, I can't find a better word. So, but it's, it's, it's a very loose sense, yeah? So there is, for Collingwood, there is a logical relation between answers, questions, and presuppositions. So, um, and you, for example, if I say to you, the sock fell behind the washing machine, yeah, that you would know that it is not an answer to the question, where is the salt? Okay? So there is a, lo a logical relationship. Not all statements are answers to questions. Only some statements answers questions. Yeah? And they are the statements which, I suppose, understand the question and therefore the presuppositions which give rise to the question. So to count as an answer to a, to a question, a statement must address the question. And to address the question, yeah, a statement must understand the presupposition which gives rise 
to the question. And if we don't understand the presuppositions which give rise to the question, then we do not understand the question. So suppose that James is in his office and the policeman barge in and says, where is he, where is he, where is he? And he says, what? He doesn't understand the question because he doesn't uh, know the presupposition that gives rise to the question, i.e. that there is a criminal on the loose. Okay. Um, so for example, I asked my daughter, Kerry, uh, where did you put your glasses? Uh, she says, I have not been in the kitchen, you Dumbo. I was in school all day. And I said, I meant your spectacles. I tell you lots of times, before you give, you answer me badly and are rude, understand <laughs> what it is that I'm actually asking you. So understand the presupposition that give rise to the question. Now, so questions, uh, statements are answers to questions and they have to address the question. There's a kind of logical relation in a kind of loose sense, yeah? Now for Collingwood, explanations are requests for because answers to why questions. Um, and like any answer, in order to be an answer to a question, they have to, in order to be explanatory, they have to address the, the specific kind of why question that is being asked. So just as the statement, the salt is on the table, does not answer the question, where is my spotty sock gone? Um, just because we're using the word because, yeah, it doesn't mean that the because is genuinely explanatory if it doesn't address the specific why, yeah, that is a work in, in the question. So just to illustrate this, this is unfortunately a, a real story. So when Kerry was nine, a boy in her class died, Jack. Um, and, uh, and so she came home and she asked me, I oh, why did Jack die? Uh, right, okay, so how do you answer that question? Um, I clearly was very worried. I, 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 I Googled like mad because you know, in case it was something catchy, you know. Uh, and uh, what had happened is that he went on a trip and then developed a cold and developed an infection. The infection went, went to, 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 to the heart, fluid uh, built around the heart, and it caused a heart attack. And so I said that to her. That, that, that's why John died. <laughs> and, so, and she replied, how can you be such an idiot? You know, I do not want the cold fact story. I want the warm feeling story. Now, Kerry's not a philosopher, okay? But, but I yeah. think that what she meant is that you dumbo, I want a teleological answer to my question. I don't want a nomological causal answer to my question. I don't want to know what normally happens when fluid builds around people's heart, you know? Um, and so, I, you know, I did say to her, well, look, you know, in this case, I do not think that there is, that I can give you the answer you want, you know? Uh, because I'm not a believer. I don't believe that there is a God who had a plan for, for Jack. If I believe that, I could give you a reason answer rather than a causal answer to your question. But in this case, I can't do that. However, what she did is that she identified that there is a different kind of explanation that perhaps I don't feel I can give in this context, but is required in some, some other context and made a distinction between explanations that have different forms. So perhaps I'm reading too much on what she does, I don't know, but <laughs> I'd like to think that. <laughs> but what this seems to show is that if we want to satisfy somebody's curiosity, we've got to properly match the because with their why, yeah? Otherwise, we don't answer that question. So in order for a statement to be an answer to the question that it that is asked, he must address that question. In order for an explanation to satisfy the curiosity of the questioner, he must provide the right kind of because answer, one which matches the why question which was asked. Now, for Collingwood, the role of the critical thinker or the philosopher is to disambiguate why questions to establish what kind of because answer they call for, they need. So, in sum, knowledge for Collingwood is a search for answers to questions. Questions arise because presuppositions are made. If there were no presuppositions, there would be no questions. 
Uh, and there are no such thing as presuppositionless questions, and by implication, there is, there are, there is no such thing as presuppositionless knowledge. Now, philosophy, in its view, is concerned with presuppositions in general, but is also concerned with certain kind of pivotal presuppositions, some certain fundamental ones. So, for example, um, yeah, we know that the ability to make certain inductive generalizations is based on, uh, based on past experiences, relies on the principle of the uniformity of nature. So you've got to presume that uh, water freezes at zero Celsius now, as it did in the Middle Ages uh, and uh, in prehistoric times. Um, uh, but, uh, we, and we have to presuppose that in order for, uh, for us to be able to carry out our, our inductive generalizations. Now, for Collingwood, uh, something like the principle of the uniformity of nature would be uh, the sort of presuppositions that philosophers are uh, interested in. It would be a kind of uh, pivotal presupposition uh, that governs a form of inquiry. Now, when he speaks about forms of inquiry, it doesn't uh, identify, say, inquiries with, uh, which use certain kind of inference with a specific discipline. Yeah? I think there's a slight difference between talking about a discipline and talking about a form of inquiry. So for example, uh, you might find inductive generalizations at work in different places. You might find rationalizations at work in different places. So th there's a slight differences between the two. Now, uh, he calls these pivotal presuppositions absolute presuppositions. Um, and he claims that these presuppositions give rise to questions. Uh, they require certain types of because answers. Yeah. So if you if you ask a why question uh, that is calling for a regularity answer, yeah, uh, then uh, uh, a teleological answer will not do. Yeah, and vice versa. Uh, the particular type of because answer that is, uh, that is given depends on the presuppositions that, that are made, but yet the presuppositions hide themselves. Yeah? So we ask these questions, but uh, the presuppositions are not, uh, they're not, I suppose, on the surface. And it is the job of, philosopher, of, the philo of philosophy to bring them to light. Now, what he would say is something along these lines, um, that there are certain why questions that can be because answered by appealing to law-like regularities, to kind of nomological explanations, yeah? So for example, uh, Jack's illness is one like that. You could say, uh, well, he died because that sort of thing happens when, when fluid builds around the heart. You're picking on a regularity. But Kerry's why question is not answered by that kind of because answer. Yeah, it requires a different kind of purposes or, or teleological answer. Perhaps in that, you know, in some cases we cannot give those answers. But the point is that there are different kind of questions and different kinds of, of answers. And as we've seen, the, role, the, the, the job of the critical thinker is to, to dis disambiguate these why questions. So, for example, take this question. Why did JFK die? Okay. Okay, you can answer it in different ways. You can say because he was the victim of political conspiracy uh, or he was assassinated by a lone killer. Or you could say because his skull was pierced by two bullets which caused a brain hemorrhage. Okay. Now what Collingwood would say is that be because 1A and 1B yeah, are the same kind of because. Yeah. Uh, because too is a different kind of because which answers a different kind of, of why questions. And that because one and because two do not compete. And we think that they compete only when we assume that they are answering the same kind of questions. But they're not because they're answering questions which arise as the result of making different kinds of presuppositions. So uh, JFK was the victim of a political conspiracy and JFK was assassinated by a lone killer are uh, competing answers 
to the same question. Okay? So uh, one of them will be true and the other will be false. But in the case of the kind of answer that would be given by a coroner, yeah, rather than the kind of answer that would be given by a political journalist, those two answers don't compete. Uh, it is a mistake to think that they compete. So we have to make an important distinction between the right answer and the right kind of answer. Now, the right answer is given within the special sciences. So there is a correct, true, or false answer to the question, what, you know, who killed JFK? Was it the victim of a political conspiracy or was he killed by a lone killer? Maybe we won't know, but there is a true or false answer to, 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 to that question. Uh, there is a true or false answer to the question, what is the atomic composition of gold? Um, who killed Alexander Litanyenko? And so on and so forth, yeah? Uh, philosophy doesn't do that. It doesn't tell us which is the right answer to those questions. But on the other hand, it checks that we do not mismatch the why and the because. It is concerned with different kinds of, uh, of answers, <coughs> not with the right answer, but with different kinds of answers. And he makes this point in, uh, in quite a well-known passage of Anessa Metaphysics, where he, he, he gives this anecdote. He says, well, imagine that there is an AA, uh, there is a person who's um, a driver who's has, got, uh, has been driving uphill, okay? and he reached, uh, the car reached the point when, when it stopped. Um, and he wondered, why did my car stop? And then he says, well, imagine that something, somebody comes along. And the first person who comes along is, theore is a theore theoretical physicist. And the theoretical physicist tell him, oh, hey, sir, I know why your car stopped working. That's because the center of the Earth is further <coughs> removed, uh, sorry, the, because the bottom of the hill is further removed from the center of the Earth than the bottom of the hill, yeah? Uh, and so it takes, you know, uh, it takes a while to go. Okay. Then the second person who comes up, on the other hand, is an AA man and says, oh, I know what's happened. Look, you've got a loose cable. Um, now, you know, uh, you know, Collingwood is, is saying, well, look, um, you've, w when you provide answers, you, you've got to match them. You've got to understand what somebody is asking, yeah? In this case, uh, the, the reply of the theoretical physicist doesn't answer the question that the man who wanted his car fixed wanted answered. So we've got this pivotal presuppositions that give rise to kind of questions, yeah, that uh, need certain kind of answers, yeah. Uh, so he calls these pivotal presupp uh, presuppositions absolute presuppositions. And he thinks that these open up different ways of seeing. So the presuppositions of the uniformity of nature, for example, discloses the world as a system of causal laws, of natural laws. Um, it discloses everything that happens as being nomologically connected. Uh, but uh, the presuppositions which govern, on the other hand, certain humanistic pursuits um, is that that reality can be explained by using purposive explanations. So you have, in some sense, to presuppose that people are rational and capable of acting in accordance with, uh, with cert, uh, to follow certain goals. And in his view, something like Carrie's question, as we've seen, cannot be answered by, uh, by telling her what normally happens when an infection reaches <coughs> a vital organ, uh, matches the political historian's questions, what was the cause of JFK death? cannot be answered by uh, the, the coroner's uh, verdict. Uh, and that's because there are these different conceptions of reality that are, that are open up by the different absolute presuppositions. And what philosophy does is to oil the hinges when we get stuck on one set of presuppositions. So his view is that we are kind of stuck onto the scientific image, yeah, uh, with the kind of explanations that, 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 that it deploys. Um, and what he wants to do is to dislodge that and to show, well, that's an image that we have because when we make a certain uh, set of, of presuppositions. So what does a philosopher do, according to Collingwood? Um, well, it, the philosopher makes certain important conceptual distinctions. Um, 
uh, it um, disambiguates the cause answers um, by distinguishing between kind of explanations that address different kind of questions. Um, and it shows that different kinds of explanations have different explananda. Yeah? So they explain different things. Uh, we're not multiplying things here. Yeah? So the coroners and, uh, uh, and, and the political historians uh, have different explananda, even if JFK died only once. So we're not multiplying. JFK did, didn't die twice. And one of his deaths was explained by the coroner, and the other was explained by the political historian. And in his view, the human sciences have, 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 a, have a distinctive uh, uh, subject matter because they provide because answers to teleological why questions. Um, and he thought that the specific subject matter of the human sciences are what he calls actions. And action, uh, he, he uses that, that I think is a technical term for Collingwood. It means that which is explained purposively or teleologically. So, uh, and it's slightly different from, say, the everyday notion of an action, uh, which tends to encompass anything from sometimes an either jerk, jerk reaction or a voluntary movement uh, and an intentional, an intentional action. So that, for him, is the specific subject matter of the human sciences. And there's, there's a reciprocal relationship for him between method and subject matter. If you explain something purposively, then you explain it as an action. If you explain something nomologically, then you explain it, as you would say, as an event. Well, again, event is uh, a technical term, yeah? Um, because it's the, I suppose, the correlative of scientific methods, yeah? So actions are the correlative of uh, the kind of humanistic method and events in the technical term are the correlative of the scientific method. Now, in his view, actions are the sui generis subject matter of, of, of humanistic explanations. So actions in the sense of uh, that subject matter which is explained teleologically uh, are the distinctive subject matter of, of humanistic explanation. So you could, it's not the human being that the human sciences study. They study human beings in a particular way. So it's not enough for something to be a human science to, to study the human being. It has to study it in a particular way. Now, in this sense, um, actions are not events, uh, where what that means, actions are not conceptually reducible to events where events are here understood as the correlative of scientific method, um, or that which is explained nomologically by appealing to, uh, to regularities. So actions, for example, are not events in the sense in which um, Siamese cats are cats. Yeah? So there, uh, Siamese, I thought that you might maybe smile at the picture of the kitten. <laughs> that, uh, so so uh, <coughs> Siamese cats are kind of cats. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, the concept of a Siamese cat is not a sui generis concept. Yeah? It's a species of the genus, cat. But if you take what he described, what the concept of action and of event for Collingwood, those are two sui generis concepts because there's no entailment relation that can lead you from one to the other in the way in which you can move from the concept, say, of a washing machine to that of an electrical appliance, yeah? Or from the concept of red to that of color. There's no entailment relationship that, that can lead you. So in this respect, philosophy, what philosophy does is to identify these sui generis concepts and the distinctive subject matter of different forms of, of inquiry. Uh, so, and that's why he believes that events are the explanandum of the natural science and that actions are the, uh, the explanandum of, of the human sciences. But we've seen that he uses this, these terms in, in a technical sense. So an event is not just anything that happens. Yeah, sometimes we use 
the term event in that way. For him, an event is not just something that happens. It's something that was happening is explained in, in a particular way. Okay, so what is the underlying metaphilo metaphilosophical picture here? Uh, well, philosophy, he claims, uh, is the invest in in investigates the presuppositions which have seen um, governs the first uh, order sciences, the special sciences. Philosophy does not produce uh, any new or any first order knowledge. So the conception of, of philosophical analysis in this respect is modest in the sense of in the sense of Frank Jackson, in the sense that it's it's not trying to do what metaphysics meant to you know as traditionally tried to do. It's not trying to tell us anything about the structures of uh, of reality. But it is not modest in another sense. In another sense, it's very ambitious uh, because it uncovers the conditions of all first order knowledge, uh, be that the human sciences or the natural sciences. So philosophy is an epistemologically first science. It is not the underlabor of science. And clearly, this is a very different conception of the role of, of philosophy than the one which underlies the view that the fundamental relation which holds between the body and the mind is one of supervenience, which seems to be the way in which that relation is, not by everybody by any means, but you know, is normally understood. Um, now, this is not an ontologically heavy solution. There is a sense in which, like Descartes, Collingwood want to say that there is no entailment relationship between the concept of action and the concept of event, yeah, because they are the correlative of two different forms of, of explanation, and you can't move from one to the other. So he is saying they are distinct, but he is not making any heavy duty metaphysical claim because he is not moving from uh, conceivability to metaphysical possibility. Yeah, he is, he is not making that, that so he's not making from the fact that uh, we cannot conceive that them as being the same concept, that, that, they, that there are two, metaphysically speaking, two things. So the distinction between the subject matter of the human sciences and the natural sciences is not a metaphysical distinction. Um, actions is that which is understood by invoking theological explanation. Events are that which is are explainable logic. It, it, this is a methodological distinction. Um, but he also wants to claim that there is no sense in speaking of action or events independently of the methodological assumptions and presuppositions of a form of, of inquiry. So the, there, is no th there is no notion of event here that is um, uh, inquiry independent. And there are a lot of philosophers who want to use uh, uh, that kind of, uh, of notion of, um, of, of event. Um, now, this is clearly quite different from what is going on in, in the philosophy of mind. Yeah, clearly in the philosophy of mind there are there are some uh, ontologically lightweight solutions. Yeah, so for example, multiple well, there's some multiple relation uh, realization functions are not ontologically heavy. So they say, well, look. Um, uh, there could be beings that have a very different physiology from ours that you know that they're, they're made up very differently, um, but still they could have minds. Yeah. So in that case, that that's not an ontological claim. But for Collingwood, I mean, this wouldn't it, it just it you know, it just wouldn't be a satisfy you know it would be like a bad meal. Uh, I mean, that's all I felt about functionalism. You know, so, so, <laughs> It, it always left me hungry because um, it's a causal theory of the mind, not the normative functionalism that I, I found out. I, uh, but this kind of functionalism is just provides a causal theory of the mind, and one wonders what's the point of, you know, you, you're calling yourself a non-reductivist, but I just I couldn't see why, what, what was the point of that? And I think, you know, you know, Colin was saying, well, it's not, it, it is methodologically reductive. Yeah, it, there's there's no defense of the at the methodological level. Uh, uh, of the autonomy of the human sciences. On the other hand, you can compare it with uh, um, 
with some sort of uh, ontologically heavier so solutions, um, uh, something like naturalistic dualism, um, or the claim that uh, there are irreducibly mental properties, yeah, that cannot, this cannot be reduced to physical properties. Um, and sometimes, you know, this, this form of property dualism uh, is, uh, as, as in the case of Chalmers, is uh, uh, reconciled with a naturalistic picture by claiming that, yes, there are these ontologically irreducible properties, but, you know, they don't, at least to some extent, they don't threaten naturalistic pictures they, because they don't, they don't threaten the principle of causal closure because they do not causal work, you know. So some people thought that to say that mental properties are, are causal danglers was an objection. Some people think, oh, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So um, now for Collingwood, what well, Collingwood is saying, look, the causal closure of the physical is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a presupposition of natural science. So if you look at the world as a scientist, yes, of course, you know, you have to presuppose the, the causal closure of the, of, of the physical. There's this, this, you know, um, from the point of view of natural science, all reality is causally determined. But scientific theories are answers to scientific why questions, which do not compete with explanations which address different kinds of, of why questions, in the way in which the coroner's answer doesn't compete with the political journalist answer in the case of JFK's death. So causal overdetermination is a problem for accounts of the mind-body relation, which rely on a layered view of the sciences, uh, and on a view that the top level supervene. So if you, once you assume that model of sub sub subvenience and supervenience, then of course you get this problem. <clears throat> But what also that means is that the, the problem of causal overdetermination, which some forms of epiphenomenalism, or especially epiphenomenalists that look at epiphenomenalism as a virtue, um, that they seek to circumvent, um, uh, it, that what these epif epiphenomenalists try to do is to, I suppose, circumvent not a problem, but a pseudo problem. Because uh, <coughs> And let me qualify this. Sometimes when you hear this word pseudo problem, then one uh, thinks, all right, okay, so Collingwood thinks that <coughs> philosophy, philosophers are making mistakes, um, uh, he's advocating some kind of therapeutic conception of philosophy. I don't think that's what, what White is doing. Yeah? So on the one hand, his conception of philosophy is deflationary because there's no uh, heavy duty metaphysics that he's engaging with, but he does think that there is a genuine philosophical problem that, that, that that, uh, that we are talking about, except that this genuine philosophical problem is not a problem about, say, mental causation or causal overdetermination, uh, and so on and so forth, but that the real problem is which question should be answered by natural science on the one hand, and which questions on the other hand should be answered by, by the human sciences. And that's where the philosopher has a, has a very important role in making those conceptual distinctions that have no, if you like, deep ontological um, uh, implications, as in, as in the case of Descartes, and possibly um, some of this uh, neo-Cartesian strategies that are now being used um, in contemporary philosophy of mind. There's probably, there is clearly much more to be said about how Collingwood would fit in contemporary philosophy of mind. But it's clear from this that whatever he's doing is non-reductivism is definitely of a, of a very different ilk from the one that, that you find in your standard introductions to, to the philosophy of mind. Um, and what he tries to show, I think, is that, uh, you know, it's a, what for me makes it uh, interesting is that, you know, as I said earlier on, is that if you look at at, at the philosophy of mind and how it's gone from the 1950s, what you find is a lot of non-reductivism. I mean, everybody is jumping on the non-reductivist bandwagon, but it's really weak, that, that form of non-reductivism. So at one level, non-reductivism has prevailed. So you get function, multiple reali realization functionalists, you get uh, non-reductive physicalists, you get explanatory gap theorists, you get naturalistic dualists. Mm -hmm. But really, um, naturalism seems to have won the kind of philosophical war. Um, and on the other hand, 
what Collingwood is not trying to do is what, like, what some sun panpsychists are doing now, which is to say, it seems to be turn things upside down, yeah, and replace one isma with with another. What he wants to do is to try and do justice both to the perspective of the natural science, both say to the scientific image and the the manifest image, without reducing them. Thank you. Keep your hands up, please. We'll start with Soren first. Go I guess ahead. I'm going to get questions about unity, am I? Uh, I, I? I don't know. I, I wasn't going to ask about unity. I wanted to ask about the... I mean, it seemed to be... One implication seems to be that there isn't really... Uh, there are no specific questions for philosophy or philosophy doesn't seem to have it not being a first order um, type of inquiry then the kind of questions he's going to answer are questions like you said questions about what is the right answer we could get to this question or is science, natural science supposed to answer this question or some other question and this seems to be disappointing in a number of ways first of course because then there isn't really something first order that philosophy is supposed to deal with. But secondly, because philosophy seems to be dealing with uh, an inquiry which natural sciences seem to be able to do on their own. Namely, a, a, a scientist is able to say, look, this is not the kind of question I'm going to be able to answer. I'm going to answer mm -hmm. a different kind of question. And that, that's... A Can I answer this now before I forget? Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I think that for Collingwood, the distinction between the philosopher and the natural scientist is not a distinction between two people. Yeah? It's a distinction between an activity. So the philosopher can reflect, the scientist can reflect on what he does. When he does that, he is a philosopher. Yeah? Uh, so in that sense, it, 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 you know, for, for calling a philosophy is not something that is done in academic departments, or uh, it's not a distinction between disciplines in that sense. It's an activity. And when you reflect on, you know, on what you're doing, then you're thinking philosophically. It doesn't really matter what that you might, you might be a, a neuroscientist, you might be, you know. But when you do that, then you put your philosophical hat on. So perhaps but philosophy is everywhere, in a way. It's ubiquitous. Everybody does it. My daughter does it, you know. But I think the scientist can answer the, uh, can say, look, this is not the something I can answer without reflecting. No. Scientist gets a question uh, concerning uh, um, w which requires a, a teleological answer. Is going to say no. This is not the kind of question I'm uh, going to answer without needing to do any kind of philosophical reflection. It's just in the nature of the discipline that they are going to say the scientist is going to say no. I'm not answering this question. This is not what I'm doing. Without having to reflect what the nature is, what the presuppositions are, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, but I agree with you that philosophy need not be some kind of mm -hmm. academic discipline and it requires uh, but but I still would my worry still remains that um, that 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 there might, might might be something problematic about this but I think that there was something else I was uh, uh, f something further I, I was worried about um, namely uh, is the philosopher going to raise uh, questions f with certain presuppositions and are these presuppositions some kind of third kind of presuppositions which are neither natural part of the natural sciences nor part of uh, human sciences and why would we exclude philosophy uh, as a discipline which is part of the human sciences why not say philosophy is part of the human sciences and perhaps does have some first order um, concerns as well, in the way in which other human sciences do. Um, um, I guess I guess that's um, that's that's what worries me with this kind of view mm. of philosophy. And yes. Okay, I think that what Collingwood would say is that uh, 
the philosopher in itself doesn't make presuppositions, but it looks at the presu it, it looks at the presuppositions that are being made. So, so it's not uh, propounding. Uh, you know, it's not saying, look, um, um, we have to presuppose this or that, or or it is making presu. It's looking at the way in which presuppositions are operative. And don't yeah? you need presuppositions in order to look at the? What, what would be the presuppositions that you need in order to look at presuppositions? Well, I guess some kind of <laughs> uh, meta, meta philosophical framework. I mean, you, you do need, depending on the philosopher you are, you do need to start from somewhere. I mean, if knowledge requires some presupposition, I suppose the philosopher would need. I mean, if there is no question without pre and no answer without the presupposition, then why would the philosopher be presuppositionless? Because, <laughs> because the, the philosopher looks at the questions and answers that people are asking and, 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 and giving, mm. and then looking into the presuppositions. Because if the philosopher were advancing some knowledge claims, mm. yeah, if philosophy w were a first order science and making first order claims, then you could legitimately ask, what are the presuppositions that underpin your, 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 your knowledge claims? But what Collingwood is, say, is not saying, he thinks that philosophy in that sense doesn't give us knowledge, it gives us understanding. In that sense, perhaps, I mean, you know, um, it's a claim that Hacker made in a in a paper in a, which was published in the I don't know what it's called um, philosophy, not a form of knowledge, but understanding. I can't remember exa the the exact title. So, if philosopher, if the philosopher were were making knowledge claims, then one could legitimately ask of the philosopher, what are the presuppositions that underpin that knowledge claim? Um, but that is not Collingwood's understanding of philosophy. Um, so in some sense, you know, philosophy has, you know, the content has to be given by, by the special sciences, and it is that second order reflection. So I don't think, because I think sometimes people ask me about that, oh, there must be a self-reflexivity problem there that Collingwood has. Um, but I'm not sure he does have it, because he does not subscribe to the view that philosophy gives us knowledge. If he did, then, you know, then he would. Don't you think it's a bit naive? Because, I mean, if you are not a Colin Woodian, let's say, mm -hmm. then you would say Colin Wood is wrong. And then you would say, well, he starts from some presuppositions which I don't share. You I'm have, uh, yeah. yeah s uh, and, and then that would, that would mean, I mean, why, why assume that the Colin Woodian but position is presupposition? Okay. So you say, well, look, there are philosophical disagreements, yeah? Mm -hmm. People disagree with one another. So, uh, um, and uh, and they disagree because they make different presuppositions, yeah. Uh, and so there are, I suppose, the naturalists, or say the debate between causalists and anti-causalists. Yeah, they are making different presuppositions. Yeah. In a way, what Collingwood is saying is, <laughs> look, the causalist is presupposing the framework of natural science. Yeah. Uh, the anti-causalist is presupposing a different framework. It's, yeah. And that's why there is this debate and why the philosophers kind of get to an agreement, yeah? Um, so in a sense, is, is making sense of why certain philosophical disagreements persist, yeah? Uh, by showing that they arise because of certain fundamental presuppositions that, that are being made, but is not taking side on the causalist and anti-causalist debate. So if you, if you were to make an intervention there, you wouldn't say, the anti-causalist is right and the causalist is wrong. What he would be saying is that the anti-causalist uh, appeal to teleological explanations uh, reflects a point of view. Yeah? And the causalist, on the other hand, reflects another. That doesn't seem to be a naive claim, you know, whether, you know, whether you're a Colin Woodian or not, you know? Right? But then there's nowhere to go. Well, I guess it was our next in line. I well, there's a finger. <laughs> oh, go for it. Just, yeah. just very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, just you know, on the basis of what you just said, it just, just seemed to me that uh, Soren could, if he wanted to, he might, doesn't have to, uh, accept what you said about um, philosophy not being committed to knowledge claims, but a form of understanding relative to knowledge claims being made by the sciences, and still make the same complaint. Uh, it depends, this depends how the complaint being. Uh, the complaint being uh, doesn't 
attached you are to the exact me sort of mechanics of Collingwood's account. But what Collingwood said is questions have to have presupposition. Uh, uh, and so unless you don't want philosophy to ask questions, then I think the complaint can still be made. And it seems, it, it, it seems to me that you, you, what, you, what you said, you do want philosophy to be able to say, ask this question, what are the presuppositions operative in this particular time? Well, of course you can. Of course you. Uh, well, of course you can do that. That's uh, so. If you are discussing philosophy, you know, when people discuss philosophy, clearly they have certain positions, and those positions have certain presuppositions. Yeah. So that that's not that's not something that I I would deny or Collingwood would would want to deny. Yeah. But you do want philosophy to philosophy to be presupposition. That's what I'm saying. It seems. Well. I suppose is that when people take, uh, for example, sides on a debate like the cause of this and the cause of this debate, yeah, then they are making certain presuppositions about what it means to explain something. Yeah? What Collingwood is saying is that those positions in philosophy that people take have presuppositions. Yeah? And what he is doing is unmasking the presuppositions that they have. Is that circular? I don't. It doesn't seem to me. It, it's just if if if, 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 you, if you have as a kind of sort of premise one, asking a question involves a presupposition. Then asking those questions about presuppositions commits you to having uh, your own presuppositions. That, that was all. Okay, so you could ask, what are the presuppositions which govern natural science? Say, or what are the presuppositions which govern um, is that making that's a presupposition? That's a philosophical question. And if Collingwood is, is, if you believe Collingwood when he says any asking a question means there's a presupposition mm. by the question, then it means the philosophy has to have presuppositions as well, even if it's not making a much claim. It seems. But the thing is that, uh, well, at least according to Collingwood, the questions are being asked within the special sciences, and the philosophers are asking what are the presuppositions that give rise to the question in the special sciences. So in some ways, it, it's it's a neo, it's a form of neo Kantian move, yeah. So you know, Kant thought that look, let's look at the presuppositions of, of of knowledge, and some of the neo Kantians say, well, you just can't stop with theoretical knowledge. You have to look at different forms of knowledge. There isn't just theoretical knowledge, and they have different presuppositions, and that's that's what he is doing. So in some ways, I mean, I see that I have to think about what you're saying, but I think that. Um, it doesn't really have a self-reflexivity problem because it's not putting forward. It's not asking the questions. Yeah, he's looking at the at the questions that people ask, including philosophers who take side on metaphysical debates. Yeah, and then looking at the presuppositions on which you know those competing sides of the metaphysical debates rest. So he's not saying free. There is free will. There is no free will. Yeah, he's not saying. Uh, actions are to be explained causally, actions are to be explained theologically. He was looking at the debate and saying, uh, um, so he's looking at those who privilege a particular form of explanation and look at the presuppositions that give rise. So that. I do want to jump yeah. Yeah. No, no, because it bothers you. We, 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 have, we have one finger and then six more questions and 23 minutes of recording time. So I have to be now a bit uh, draconian with my timing. So, Jim, you're next. Okay, it's right on this. Well, not on that question, but it seems, so take the causalist and the anti-causalist in the theory of action. Now, those deep philosophical controversies. But you get Collingwood's answer, which is, Oh, the causalist is answering, is in a because and how universe, he's answering questions framed in that way. And the anti causalist is in the why reasons teleological mm -hmm. thing, he's answering questions that way. Problem solved, it's not really a problem that can be, it's not, there won't be a real philosophical problem that these people are perennially, perennially addressing like they think they are. Once you uncover the presuppositions, you see there's the language of teleological reasons and the language of causes, and they're fighting each other, but they're just separate things. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's the way it seems to me that it comes out. It's extremely quietist. It's similar to Ryle's dilemmas, where take all the dilemmas, and what you do is when Russell says he's perceiving his own brain, you say, well, you're looking at how the light affects the retina. You're asking a scientific how question about a process. What you need is rational detection of mm -hmm. the properties. That's a why and, and the things we do just separate them and don't let them become a problem. Mm -hmm. So so I see it, so another way to put it is um, with inductive practices presupposing the uniformity of nature, Hume believes that, Kant believes that, and Bertrand Russell believes that. They all believe that a presupposition of, of the sorts of inferences we make um, rest on the, an assumption about the universe, uni uniformity of nature and then they start doing philosophy, and, and Hume says, look, it's just a meta-generalization and a habit. Kant says, Russell says it's just a priori intuitive. Kant says it's synthetic a priori. Collingwood just says, you're all having a debate that shouldn't be a debate. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, there is a sense in which, yes, he is saying there is no deep metaphysical mm -hmm. problem. Yeah? But I think that the implication that most people draw from that is that because there is no deep metaphysical problem, there is no philosophical problem. And it seems to me that's the wrong inference. It seems or that he guarantees yeah. the answer being, to th the causalist answer to certain deep problems can't be right on his view, say about free will or about intentionality or about anything, because there always will be that other why question. And the diagnosis will be that when the causalist tries to give an account of free will or perception or of teleological notions in non-teleological terms, they've already blown it. In that, sen in that sense, yes. Yeah. So it, you, you cannot explain action in his sense of action, causally, because the so as soon as you explain it like that, but that you've, just begs you've the changed the subject matter. The Why? That begs the question against the, the causalist. It says they could never be in a serious game of being... Contender yeah. But the, it, the same is for, for somebody who provides theological explanation. You know, the, it goes the other way around as well. They, they, you, know, they, they, you cannot explain everything theologically. I, well, I don't see, yeah, it goes two ways. Everyone it? will admit there's the two kinds of questions. Yeah. For Collingwood, there's always the two kinds of, the, of answers, because yes. they're answers to different questions. But all the exciting problems of philosophy, for me anyway, are ones where the scientific view attempts to be able to explain the, the teleological ones in other terms that Collingwood's always going to diagnose. I mean, it's, it's very, Ryle will always tell me I've made a mistake. Vickens, later, I'd Wittgenstein okay. will too, if I try to give uh, any. I think I have, I have tried quietness. to argue that. I think that there is a tendency to think that either philosophy is dealing with deep metaphysical problems, ontologically deep, yeah? Or um, it's, it's the kind of divide that uh, you get in um, the Yabel and Gola, you know, in that paper. So there are either the curious philosophers who think that uh, there are, you know, that philosophical questions uh, are answerable and, and they may be difficult to answer, yeah? Or they are the, uh, what did he call them, the quizzical philosophers who just don't get the questions. And, and the tendency is to think that you know, this, this sort of uh, quizzical, quizzical philosophers make light of philosophy. That, um, uh, so for example, a lot of Canapian today think that uh, if a dispute is not metaphysically deep, then it's a verbal dispute. This doesn't look to me like what he's talking about when he's saying, look, we've, we've got to, to understand that there are different kinds of explanations. That, 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 uh, that's not a verbal dispute. It's not like disputing whether something which is made of glass but it has a handle is a cup or a glass or wh whatever I can't remember the exact example that you give. so this 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 is serious for Collingwood yeah that there are you know and uh, I, you know asking you know how we should you know which um, which science should or with, with the kind of explanations that we we should look for in order to answer certain questions th those are important questions they're not they're not, you know, he's not saying that philosophers are, are, you know, philosophy is a history of mistake. He's not saying that. Well, the history of causalist wait, solutions to anything yeah. is, a, is the history of mistakes. It has to be for him. They, uh, they, they can't possibly be contenders. Well, causalists are right insofar as they explain events. 
But that no, can't think, you know, can't think. Causal can't, theories of human can't, action can't, based on reasons have to be mistaken. Well, just from his very setup of the problem. No, you can provide a causalist account of human action. That's fine, you know. Of human reasons, what, what they are and how human well, theory the, is of human well, reasons. The thing is that for him, the concept of action, the concept of a purposive explanation are correlative. So that if you're explaining something purposively, you are explaining it as an action in his narrow set, technical sense of, of the word. That does not preclude that I can't explain what my do daughter does causally. I explain it all the time when she says, you bang the door because of your hormones. You know, I provided a causal explanation of her behavior. Of course I can do that, yeah? And, in, and there are cases when that explanation is perfectly appropriate. I explain, you know. But I think th these things interweave each other. Sometimes we explain what human beings do causally, and sometimes we explain them, you know, we, we hold them responsible. That's because we think that they have, you know, it wasn't just a, a causal response. And what you're saying is that you've, you've, the, the philosopher is the one that tells you the difference, yeah, um, between the two. I have, yeah, I'm going to put my foot down now. Alexis, yeah. if, you, if you can. Yeah, I'll be very quick. I, I, yeah. wanted, I had a finger on, on your discussion mm -hmm. earlier, and I thought the main difference between this kind of question about presuppositions and philosophy is that Collingwood wants to say philosophy doesn't offer us knowledge about the world, right? So I, I, I think those, kinds of, those are the kinds of questions that he thinks have the kinds of presuppositions that he's investigating, not um, philosophical questions which don't ask questions about in his view, yeah, about the world, yeah. so they don't offer us knowledge. But yeah. under his view, we do have to revise a whole lot of philosophy that does make claims, right, about, yeah. we do have free, you know, there are all these philosophers who answer the question, do we have free will or not? And they think they're ans answering something which gives us knowledge about whether we have free will or not. Right, so under his he did a, you know, That's me, I suppose, that's not quite him, because he didn't quite engage into this, you know, uh, metaphilosophical debates about why there is no such thing as progress in philosophy. He didn't, you know, but I assume, that's what I assume that, that he would have to say. Right. Oh, sorry. No, well, I was just going to say, yeah, it is hugely revisionist, right, of, of a lot of, of the history of philosophy that has tried to, to give first, first order answers to first order questions. Yes, he, he is not doing, he is not doing metaphysics in that sense. So what, So, in his view, is that just philosophers trying to do science and doing it badly? What would, what would that be? How, what would his account be of the history of philosophy? I, well, I mean, I'd, I'd have to, to think a little bit about it, but I don't think, I think that the re he, he does think that there is such a thing as progress in philosophy. So. Um, for example, um, you know, one of the things that philosophy does is to show us the two concepts, when concepts are genuinely distinct. So for example, when Kant disambiguated the notion of the good, yeah, by showing from the a kind of uh, Aristotelian notion where there isn't really a distinction between a, you know, a, a moral good and a thriving life. Yeah? That's philosophical progress because you've, you, you've disambiguated a concept that in Aristotle is um, uh, doesn't make sufficiently fine-grained distinctions, yeah, in order to be able to tell you that it that you can be a moral human being and yet a miserable sod, you know, and have a really bad life. You know, if you don't have a fine-grained conception of the good, you can't make those conceptual distinctions. Now, it seems to me that if a philosopher makes those conceptual distinction. It, it does something quite important. So clearly, when we distinguish between reasons and causes, yeah, when we distinguish between teleological and causal explanations, we make an important distinction. If you went to a court of law and you didn't have that distinction, and you held somebody morally responsible for which they are only causally responsible, then you know, might send them to jail <laughs> um, without good cause. So what the philosopher does, so this is what I'm trying to say is that Yes, it's a deflationary approach. He is not doing traditional metaphysics, but he's not making light of what philosophers are doing. And for me, that's why his metaphilosophy is interesting, because it 
it falls in between, I suppose, the quizzical and the curious, in, if we are using sort of uh, the Yabu, Yabu Gaulois classification. And it challenges this view that either you do deep ontology, yeah, or you think the philosophy, philosophers are just, you know, it's just a pile of nonsense. He doesn't want to accept that view. I think I'm reconstructing him in some, you know, in some ways, you know, that's me using him. But I think that's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to say something very briefly about no, your, your no, question. quick. <laughs> no, on the your, you can't. Your just question about um, uh, Garrett Carey's question, right? In which you said, "Oh, there is no answer to that question. Why yes. did Why did he die?" I mean, that's what philosophers kind of do, right? So they don't just say, okay, your question has these presuppositions. They often also say, this question is meaningless, right? So there is no answer to the question. So for example, a causalist about action might say, look, teleological, dude, there is no, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> yeah. that kind of question that you're asking is an illegitimate question. Sure, you're presupposing okay. all this stuff. Yeah. No, yeah. yeah, so the kind of, your well, answer in a way, that, in a, in a way I, I did say that to her after. I said, well, look. But isn't that what philosophy does yeah. most of the time, say, that kind of question that's is what Collingwood, that, That's what Collingwood claims philosophy. It does, yeah? It disambiguates those questions, yeah? And but so it's it more than disambiguation. It's the same, this whole realm of this whole type of question is not relevant to this kind of uh, topic. This form of inquiry is not relevant here. Or it's reconstructable or it's, or in, or it's terms reconstructable in terms of some other. Yeah. And that's much more than this. I don't, I, I'm sorry, but I don't get the point. Sorry, I should uh, okay. so Maybe you should re-ask your questions, because what I did say to Carrie after is that, in a way, what I did say to her, I think that you have, no, I didn't say this to her. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have identified a form of teleological <laughs> purpose of explanation <laughs> that is different from causal explanation. Well done, you're, you know, you're a budding philosopher. Not even some of my colleagues make that distinction. You know? <laughs> so, uh, uh, but in this case, you cannot use it. You know, it, it's the wrong context in which to 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 appeal to that to that. I didn't quite say that. But I said, look, you know, if I believed in God, yes, I could give you the the the, the answer that you want me to give, but I, I don't, so I can't give it to you. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't think, think what that we're is, getting yeah. at is that the sort of heavy duty philosophical work happens yeah. at that stage where you say, and there is no kind of answer to that kind of question. But well, that's heavy duty, but it's not metaphysically heavy duty, is it? Okay. Is it not to say there's. I say I don't well, believe what do we mean by it. metaphysically heavy duty? I mean the traditional conception of metaphysics, yeah? Well, like, like Hume agrees that we ask uh, why questions based on reasons about human action, and that that's different than saying his body was just pushed by the wind. So there's how causal questions and reasons questions. But he's got a causalist theory yeah. of practical reason. Yeah. So it's not like he's changing the question to some mecha. He, he's saying, here's a substantive issue. People think there are these sui generis reasons things that are teleological in some irreducible way. Yeah. And Hume says, no, there are acting in accordance with reason is just a very complicated but causalist thing. Collingwood comes along and says, ah, it's still causeless, though, so we still have real reasons explanations. But Hume is in the, in the business of saying there's nothing that needs to occupy the mysterious real reasons explanations because a fancy enough causeless theory can explain how the human Well, I works. think that, that Collingwood would deny. So he would, I think he would say, yeah, yeah he, he would deny that. He would say there is a genuine distinction, yeah, between... He would, he would beg the question in favor of the reasons, in favor of the non-causalist practical reasons. Well, the fact that he makes the distinction doesn't mean that he uh, he says that causalists are always wrong. In some cases, you know, those causalist explanations are called for and they're required. He's not saying that those causalist explanations can never be used. Yeah, but what he is saying is that there is a conceptual distinction to be made between the two. And that's what it's, and that's the point that Hume is, is denying that presumably yeah you're saying that rational explanations are ultimately species of causal ones. No, he grants yeah. the distinction and says the one can be explained in terms of the other. Josie, I, I really do need mm. to make room okay. for two for, for at least two more. So Jim and then Parisa. Do you think um, Collingwood overstates the um, difference between the kind of explanations that go on in uh, physical? on in human sciences on the other. For example, 
example, um, uh, I would claim that um, social scientists, psychologists, and sociologists, and certainly, certainly psychiatrists, um, would deny that uh, all the explanations that they offer are purely teleological and uh, never yeah, cited yeah. in terms of causal entity. Yeah, absolutely. So the this distinction is not between this discipline and that discipline. It's between two forms of inferences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, for example, um, you you know you get an archaeologist, and some of them are humanistically oriented archaeologists who who answer teleological kind of one question: what was the spot for, or you know why. Mm -hmm. or, and others, on the other hand, are forensic archaeologists. Yeah. So absolutely, disciplines are mixed. Yeah. Um, in the way in which I mix my explanation when I explain my daughter's behavior, and sometimes mm -hmm. I say that she acts because of her hormones, and sometimes, on the other hand, I ascribe her reasons for acting. Yeah. So disciplines are mixed in that sense. Mm -hmm. They're not pure. Yeah. But nonetheless, the point that he's making is that there are different forms of explanation. So when the uh, the the archaeologist he is using purposive explanation, then he is not a natural scientist. Yeah. What about when we try to explain um, the behavior, if behavior is the right word, of um, plants, so to speak? You know, they actually hunt for insects. Mm -hmm. They exhibit all the you know, signs of purposeful, psychological behavior. Yeah. So what would you say about that? Well, in a way, he didn't say anything about that. And there's mm -hmm. clearly a much finer grain distinction between the natural sciences. And when we speak about you know, the natural and the human sciences, that is to cross a distinction. However, mm -hmm. the important point here is that once you accept that there is methodological pluralism, you have really made the fundamental point. Then you might say, uh, and forms of explanations are much more fine-grained, you know, they, you know, when you go down to the very special sciences, they, 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 they differ in important ways. But what he's trying to establish is a point of principle, yeah, mm -hmm. between the kind of uh, uh, normative, in, in some ways it's got something in common with Davidson, who claims that, you know, look, reasoned explanations have a, have a normative aspect that you don't find in the natural world. Mm -hmm. What he doesn't share with Davidson is, I suppose, the metaphysics. Um, uh, Davidson is a monist Another. of some kind. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Collingwood is an explanatory pluralist, is, is not touching the ontology in that mm. sense, uh, which you know makes him open to some objections, but also gets him out of a number of other yeah. problems. Parisa? Um, so this has probably been touched on in a number of ways, but I'd just like to put it in terms that I can understand. Um, there's so many different aspects of this that are so interesting. So um, I guess the way that I would like to frame this question is um, when, in the process of philosophizing, because you've made it clear that it's not a philosopher and a scientist, it's mm -hmm. the process of doing philosophy and mm -hmm. what's different from doing that. In the process of philosophizing, when we decide that there are these question and some matches and mismatches, mm -hmm. um, I hope you don't think this is a stupid question, but is the philosopher discovering something there, or are they deciding something there? What's happening when they, when there's a recognition of a mismatch? Um, so to, to give you an example, I think yeah. what happens is that you refine your conception map. You, you make it more fine-grained. So the example, you know, the example I gave was the case of Aristotle's conception of the good, which is not very fine-grained because it includes both the moral good and, you know, what's good for you. Now, when you distinguish the moral good from what's good for you, then you've got a finer-grained distinction that enables you to say certain things that you would not really be able to say unless you made those concepts more determinate, and that's. You know what we're doing when we distinguish is Collingwood doesn't even speak about reasons and causes. It speaks about different concepts of causation and work in different in different areas or different meanings of the term cause, mm -hmm. yeah, or because. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's what happens when we do that. So just to clarify then, when so when um, when Collingwood's asking a question like, um, can 
natural science answer this kind of question? The answer that the philosopher would come up with is, well, kind of, but actually there are two questions here. And one of them heads off in this direction and another heads off in that direction. So where we thought there was one question, there are actually two. Is that the kind of thing that philosophy is doing? Yeah, possibly, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Um, I think so, yes. I'll talk. Yeah, no, I, think, no, 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 no. I think I think I think that's right. Yeah. Sorry, I'm ahead of the interesting things. I'm walking into a <laughs> 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 I'm genuinely curious because it seems like there is a, a, a at least there's some kind of decision that's being made when you when you make that decision. Uh, when, when decision. You, well, yeah, it seems to me at least like there's a decision being made when you decide. I, I know that sounds kind of circular, but when you sort of recognize or whatever that there are two questions. Just because there, there seems a, a sense in which a lot of people are attempting to subsume um, things, but that this is important. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's what he's trying to do. So the, the answer now that I see there is no trap. <laughs> 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 yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, let's <laughs> we have time for one last oh, question. Oh, more. <laughs> oh, okay. Basically, this reminds me about Rancier theory of disagreements. Jacques Rancier, which say yeah. that disagreement theories. Basically, it seems that we do philosophy when we intervene in a dispute to, to solve our disagreements, like two people saying the same thing but meaning two different things. Mm -hmm. So we say, look, your presupposition is different from the mm -hmm. other one, and this is a kind of philosophy being helpful to the, to the mm -hmm. you know, to the research, and so two questions. First one is, imagine a situation in which, I don't know, science is going very good and everybody is, you know, sharing presuppositions, so they are just matching good questions with related answers. So, where is space for philosophy in that case? What we, what we, what philosophy can do in that case if every answer is, you know, matching the, the, the touch question? And the other one is, um, what would he say say about the possibility of for philosophy of you know distinguishing between the epistemic openness of different questions? Because you you made you made for example the, same, the example of salt. So if I ask you where is salt, you say yeah, my name is. It's very hard to 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 happen such a situation. If I ask you, are you free? Obviously.